Welcome everyone to episode 29 of Games with Go. Uh, today we're finally going to start uh, rendering fonts for the first time using SDL. So to render fonts, we're going to use an SDL2 extension called SDL2 TTF. And this is capable of loading up uh, true type fonts and <clears throat> creating textures out of them, which you can use to draw the text on the screen. So to get this is uh, going to be a little bit of, of uh, work to get it all set up, uh, especially on Windows. Um, the first thing we need to do is actually get the header files and the uh, libraries for SDL TTF uh, set up on your machine. So on Linux and Mac, this is uh, pretty easy. Um, you'll just run this command. Uh, you want to type sudo before this, uh, so it'll be sudo apt install libsdl2 and then dash ttf to get the ttf library and then dash dev. And then on <clears throat> Mac, you can use brew apparently. There may be other ways. I'm not aware of them. And then <clears throat> finally on Windows, it's a big mess, uh, which you may remember from when we set up sdl2, uh, the main uh, library earlier like in episode six so we're kind of gonna we're gonna go through that same process except we already have um, the C compiler installed so we don't have to do that again uh, so first step is to get the development libraries for Windows so these next steps are Windows only so if you're on Linux you can just hang out and laugh at us uh, so this link takes us to the lib SDL page and here they have a couple things we'll need. Um, first is the, a link to the source zip. Uh, you want to click on that. Oh, actually, you know what? We don't. We don't need the source zip. You know that. We need the development libraries for Windows. And if you're using the same compiler setup we have, uh, we used back to set up SDL originally, you want this one, the mingw32 slash 64 bit development libraries. So click on that and hmm. I'm going to actually save link. Downloads extract here. Okay. <clears throat> so once you get that unzipped, and you'll need something like WinRAR to do it. Uh, you want to drill down into x86-64 folder. And then we'll start at uh, the bin folder. Oh, so then open up another uh, Explorer window and <clears throat> go to where we installed mingw before. So for me, that was at c colon slash mingw. And then drill down to that next folder, keep drilling down. And you'll want to go to this one here, mingw32. And now basically we're just going to copy whatever's in these uh, into these. So open up bin on both sides. And just copy all of that over and say replace if it asks. <clears throat> then we'll back up in each, go into include, include, SDL2, SDL2, and this copies the header file over. Uh, Go will need this header file in order to uh, compile the bindings that let Go talk to the C library. So back up twice, back up twice, then go into lib, I think you can just drag everything over, replace if it asks. Okay, <clears throat> so that should set up uh, the libraries and header files in our compiler's environment so that it can find them. So <clears throat> back up to our web browser. Um, so now to install the Go bindings for SDL TTF, uh, bring up a command prompt. We can do it from our command prompt here. Um, 
we need to run this command, go get dash v github.com slash vanco go sdl2 tpf. So I'm just gonna paste that in here. And then while we're here, um, go ahead and run go get dash u github.com go sdl2 slash sdl. And now we'll just update the sdl2, the regular sdl2 bindings uh, in case there's been any updates since we last messed with it. <clears throat> okay, so if all of that worked for you, if, or if anyone ran into any problems in that process, uh, let me know in chat and we can try to work through it. There's a lot of little steps. But at this point, we should have uh, the library installed and ready to use. Uh, so we could test that by saying github.com slash vanco go sdl2 ttf. And this should just say, yeah, imported and not used. So that means it, it found it, so that's good. All right, next up, we're gonna need a font. And <clears throat> I have a font set up at gameswithgo.org uh, slash rpg slash font.zip. And I'll put that into chat. Why didn't I see that? Let me refresh chat real quick. I'm not seeing anything up here. Okay, just my dashboard's not showing them. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, okay, so we'll grab that font file. <clears throat> and we'll wanna copy these into our game. So navigate to your Project root, github.com, RPG. And this is all going to be in the UI. The game itself isn't going to know about fonts, so only the UI will need to know. And we can put it in the assets folder along with the uh, tiles. And this is just a free font I found. There are some free font websites. Uh, you're welcome to pick any font you want. This one looks kind of like a medieval or gothic script. I thought it looked kind of cool. But you can use anything. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so how do we use it? So the, the basic approach is you can give um, SDLTTF a string, and it will turn it into a texture for you. So that's the, the basic process. And you can tell it uh, what size you want it to be. And an important thing to keep in mind is you don't want to <clears throat> pass it a string and create a texture in, inside your game loop and do it every frame. You want to do it just once and keep the texture around. So let's see. I have some old code where I've done this before. All right, let's try it. <clears throat> so we've got TTF imported. So let's just try drawing some text. Uh, let's try creating a texture when we start up. We'll kind of do hello world with our font. So we're going to need our renderer, I think. 
So we'll do it here at the end. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right, so we've got our TTF package. Got these different render functions. So what are those options again? We had blended, blended wrapped, shaded, and solid. Let's start out with blended. And we'll just say hello world. We have to give it a color. Um, start out with start with red, R G B. Let's see. It needs a surface. Where do we get? Where do we get a surface? Let's look at the documentation. Let's see if they have some examples. Text. <clears throat> Surface. Okay, it looks like if you UTF-8 solid, you don't need a surface. <clears throat> and we need to open our font. So let's do that first. So our font is going to be in uh, UI2D assets. And what was our file name? Let's rename this to a simpler file name. Gothic.ttf. What's the second parameter? Size. In what units? Who knows? We'll find out. Okay, open our font. Okay, this returns a surface. Hello world. One more value for alpha in there. Uh, 
And this can return an error as well. Okay, so now we have a font surface. What do we do with the font surface? <clears throat> Under UTF eight solid. I bet this has changed. Let's see, what's available on a font surface? Pixels. Let's see. <clears throat> so we want to take a surface to a texture, I think. Surface. Okay, create texture from surface. Easy enough. It's going to be in renderer. There we go. Create texture from surface. And this returns texture and an error. Okay, so for now, we just want to see if this is all working. We're just going to add a hello world. Which is an SDL texture. And we'll just say UI hello world. <clears throat> Equals render to create the okay. Cool. So then we will just draw that texture every time through the loop. So here we're drawing the level. We'll jump into there. And we'll say ui.renderer.copy, ui.hello world. And we'll just draw it at the top left. Let's see what happens. We crashed. Library not initialized. Okay, so that means <clears throat> up in our new UI, where actually, do we have an init function? I'm going to change this to panic error as well. Okay, so we have to initialize the TTF library. 
Now we're doing that. There it is. We're drawing, we're drawing text. It's amazing. <clears throat> I wonder why it has gray around it though. Let's experiment with different ways of drawing it. <clears throat> uh, so one thing we should do is actually see how big it is. Uh, where are we doing a query? Nowhere. Okay. Where was it? <clears throat> So there's a weird thing you have to do to get the size of a texture. And I think we did it in here. Nope. There we go. <clears throat> Text.query. Let's go back to draw. UI, hello world. <clears throat> and so we're going to set the destination rectangle um, to be. Zero, zero with height. So that'll draw the font at its actual size rather than filling up the whole screen. And we need a pointer to that rectangle. Okay. <clears throat> we need to do the offsets. <clears throat> No, we don't need the offsets. That's incorrect. Oh, I'm doing that inside the error. There we go. Pull it outside the error. All right. <clears throat> So that's the actual size at size 32. Let's just experiment a little bit. Let's try double eight. Okay, it doesn't really look like it's anti-aliased at all. So let's experiment with uh, some of the different options here. So it's blended. Okay, yeah, so blended smooths out the lines quite a bit. That looks nice. And then there is shaded. Oh, you can do a background color. blue okay we don't want that for sure okay so let's go with blended I think that looked nicest
take out our background color. <clears throat> All right. We've got Hello World and a true type font. That's a good first step. Um, <clears throat> so this is a bunch of stuff we've got to do in order to draw our fonts. Uh, the font we only have to open up once though. So first thing we should do is save that font in our UI struct. So let's get rid of Hello World. And we'll make our uh, font. And we'll probably want to end up having, let's see, do we provide the size when we open it? We'll probably want to end up having different sizes. Um, so I'm going to call it font medium because we're probably going to have more. And this will probably want to be a pointer. So we'll say ui.font. Oh yeah, font medium. Probably put that back at 32 for now. Oh, it's already a font, so we can do this. It already comes back as a pointer. We don't need to be declaring anymore. <clears throat> okay, so the rest of the stuff we're going to do, um, we're going to pull out into a function. So this stuff will become string to texture, return an SDL texture. And it will take a string. And then we'll probably want this to be to let you provide a size at some point. So we might we might have an enum that we take in for the size. Let me go ahead and do that. Uh, so that'll just be an int and let's see, how should we do this? Okay, so we'll do font small. Medium font large. <clears throat> okay, so take the font size and we'll say var font. Switch on size. So we'll check for each case and set the font we're going to use accordingly. create all three sizes. Small, 
medium large. So here we'll repeat <coughs> for small. We will surely be tweaking these values later, but for now that'll be our small, medium, and large. Font small, undefined. Font medium, undefined. We don't have a UI, that's why. <clears throat> okay. So now we got a font set. <clears throat> so this will be just font. This will be a texture. And if there was no error, we will return the texture. All right, <clears throat> this is good. We've got a function now. This will be much more convenient where we can just pass a string, specify a size, and get back a texture for that string. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, let's say you had something like an ongoing uh, score total at the top of the screen. Uh, and in your main game loop, every single frame you were calling string to texture with the current score, getting back uh, a texture and rendering it. That would be really slow. It would kill your frame rate and chew up memory uh, because this, um, this operation here is actually really expensive. right? It's going through the mathematical definition of the font for each letter you're specifying, computing what the pixel value should be, allocating memory for a texture, and <clears throat> returning that texture. That's a lot of work. So <clears throat> the idea is once you've got a string uh, that you want to render, you only want to call this once for that string, and then keep the texture around until you don't need it anymore, until that string is no longer being rendered. So if you wanted to do something like have uh, a timer that's going on where there's numbers changing all the time, what you're going to want to do is probably save each digit, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, um, as a texture and, and keep those around and use those to draw uh, your time. Right? So it's a little bit tricky dealing with fonts when you're using a low-level library. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> OK, so what should we do uh, first? with our stuff here. So when people play the game, uh-oh, a little open the font, of course. We're no longer going to render that. So we need to think about what <coughs> what sort of strings we're going to show. Uh, so one way that RPGs sometimes work is if you attack something, it'll like show some text just above what happened. Um, another way some work is they have like a little um, like <coughs> console area where like a history of the last events like kind of scrolls up. So we kind of need to think about what we're going to do because that's going to decide how we're going to do our text rendering. So let's try having like a little uh, console area where we're going to draw um, draw the events that have happened. And in fact, we can make like the whole bottom of the screen kind of an inventory toolbar area eventually. 
So we need to start setting that up. So first, let's just try building a Let's just try building out the messages logically. So that will actually go in our game. So something our level will have will be like a list of events. So we'll have events, which will be a slice of strings. And we will make a string slice. This will allocate uh, space for our, our slice of events. And then anytime something of note happens, we'll want to push that event onto the slice. So like instead of these format.print lines, right, we'll say uh, level.events uh, equals append So that'll add new text to the list whenever we attack. And <clears throat> then the other thing we'll want to do is remove events when there's been too many. I'm not going to decide how to do that yet, but we need to think about it. We don't want these to build up forever because then we'll be storing all that text and all the fonts that can draw them potentially. We don't want to do that. Okay, so let's make a function that renders our events. So I think what we're going to want ultimately is a map of string to texture. This will be like a string uh, texture cache, you can think of it. Um, That'll be, it'll map from a string to an SDL texture. And so what we can do, uh, we'll need to initialize this when we start up for one. Uh, so UI dot make map string. Oh, we need a separate map for each font size too. So let's let's shorten this. String to text, small, medium, and large. Another way to do this would be to map like a combination of a string and a uh, size. Either either way is fine. Doesn't really matter. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do in here is we're going to check to see if the texture already exists in the cache. So we can say if uh, let's see, exists text 
is equal to uh, string to oh, UI string to text small of S. And then we say if exists, then return the texture. Got that backwards. Okay, so <clears throat> the first time we pass a string in here, it's not going to exist in the cache. So we're gonna make it, and then we're gonna put it in the cache. We'll say, hmm. We'll have to switch twice, that's fine. So then we'll say uh, string to text small of s equals text ui. And then the same for medium and small, medium and large. Check the cache for medium and large. Okay, so now our string detector will first uh, check to see if it's already cached in our map. If so, just return the texture. Otherwise, it will build the texture and then add it to the cache. So that's handy, but uh, eventually we have to think about when do we start clearing things out of the cache? Uh, how do we keep track of how old they are and when they need to go away? And not only will we need to remove the texture uh, from, the, uh, from the cache, but we also have to, to free it. I think there's a... How does the free stuff work in STL? Mm, let's see. I think we just call destroy on textures. Yeah, so we'll need to make sure we call destroy when we do get rid of a string texture that we don't need anymore. Otherwise, they'll keep, those textures will stay in, in memory indefinitely if we don't do that. Okay, so let's test this out. Um, oh, this shouldn't be hello world. This should be S. And also we should take in a color. Uh, so color, SDL color. That way it's not always red. <clears throat> so let's then, <clears throat> in our draw function, we'll draw all of the events. So we'll say uh, for um, event is equal to range. Level dot events. And the event do the color. Do red still, and then uh, size. Font large. Uh, 
Oh. <clears throat> Struct. Oh, gotta do the alpha. Cool. Okay, so now we need to copy it. Source will be nil. Uh, we're going to need to query and let's make the destination rectangle for now we'll just put it on the left so we'll start at x of zero the y increment and we'll do the width and height pass that to int32 Okay, and then let's make a uh, let's make our monsters have uh, no strength, so we can get lots of attack messages and many hit points. Player attacked. There we go. That's the basic idea we're looking for. <clears throat> so this is just the very like beginnings of having like a little console area where we can start showing the events as they happen. Um, obviously, we need to sort of put this in a small area with a smaller font. We need to get rid of uh, events once we have too many, and we need to maybe uh, make it look like it's scrolling. Um, but we've got the tools we need. We've got a string to texture function, which will be efficient and easy to use. We can just pass it a string pretty much and not worry about it. Um, that's not entirely true, right? Like if we had a uh, rapidly changing timer, this still wouldn't work very well because we'd end up with thousands of things in our cache. Uh, but it's pretty good for, I think, all the stuff we're going to use it for in the RPG we're never going to have thousands of uh, strings at the same time. And they're not rapidly changing. It's only when you make a move. <clears throat> All right, I think that's going to be it uh, for tonight. The next stuff we'll work on, probably next episode, is doing uh, some cleanup of some of the stuff that's messy and then refining the way we draw the events as they happen. Make a little a little UI thing at the bottom of the screen, and <clears throat> handle evicting old things from the cache as they go. Are there any any questions about tonight's stream so far? I'll hang out for a few minutes in case there's questions. <clears throat> and now that you see how to work with uh, <clears throat> fonts using the SDL library, um, some of you might want to go back and kind of enhance the other things we did. Like our, our Pong project used our kind of hand-coded fonts. You could, you could switch to using real ones. Uh, so chat asks, why the preference for the font size enum versus just passing a pointer to the font around? Uh, that's a good question. Probably... It would probably be a lot easier if we just passed a pointer to the font around. I like it. I'm going to change it. We'll see if anything bad happens. Let's give it a try. So we will just say this needs to take a pointer to a TTF font. And then uh, 
What about our cache though? How will we know what cache to look into? Any thoughts on that? I think we might need to keep the keep it separate. Unless we end up deciding we only want one font size. We could have different functions for small, medium, and large. This is one way to deal with it. We could check to see if the font equals small, medium, or large. Um, I think I'm going to keep keep the enum for now, but I'll I'll think about it. Yeah, we we could make the map take um, what we'd have to do because Go doesn't have uh, real tuples. Like there are some languages where you could do something like this. Like it could be this easy. You could say uh, string and pointer to a font, something like that, and it would work. Um, what we'd have to do is make something like struct string and font and have a string and a font, and this would take a string and font. It would, it would be a mess. I don't want to do that, uh, but you could. That's one, one kind of option. So I think we'll, we'll leave it with the enum, um, but that's something to think about. There might be a cleaner way, because like, there is a lot of mess in here. We could just decide to have one font size and save ourselves a lot of trouble. Another thing you can do, uh, another option, is you can just make your font very big, like make your font as big as the biggest size you will want. And then when you want to render a smaller font, you can just scale the font. Um, that does have a little bit of performance impact because you're doing more filtering on the texture when you render it. And it may not look as good, uh, but that is an option. And it, can, it, it could mean you have less memory wasted. Well, you probably have more memory wasted because every, every font is bigger than it needs to be. But that's another way you could do it is your... <clears throat> you could specify the size. You always get things from the same... Uh, cache because there's only one large size and then you just scale it differently. This is how um, specifying the font size is the same way that other game libraries work too. Like mono game, uh, you have to create multiple fonts for each size you want and work with it or make a big one and scale it. It's not, it's not just SDL. Fonts are just kind of hard. Hello, Elbow Jason. Greetings. I'm just hanging on for a few minutes to see if there's any, any questions about today's streams or past streams. Let's see, can I, can I kill the rat eventually? He has 500 hit points. Okay, so Paratrier uh, is saying he had problems getting the channels, the channel set up with the UI to work. Um, it sounds like the problem you've got is if you go to your main.go, are you calling runtime.lockos thread inside the Go routine? Because if you if you don't do this, um, then the SDL code will get called from multiple threads and it doesn't like that. Okay. Let's see. Next event matching task. Let's see what that is. Mm 
It sounds like it could be a Mac specific thing relating to like maybe working with the window. Are you on a Mac, Paratrier? Hmm. So I don't know for sure what the problem is or what the best solution is, but I know one solution that should work. Um, I'll describe it to you at a high level right now, and, and maybe uh, you can send me a chat or something. We can work it out more if you need help. But and so as long as you're only going to run one UI at a time, what you could do is instead of running the UI in a Go routine, uh, run the UI in the main thread. So you just move this uh, out to the main thread up in here and then run the game, uh, run the game in a Go routine because the game doesn't do any of the UI stuff. So it, it should be fine. So you basically just swap, like you'll, you'll say, you know, go funk game.run like that and then pull this out into the main thread and see if that works. And then you shouldn't you shouldn't need to call uh, this anymore. You might need to. Maybe you need to call that in the main thread too. But you can play with it and see. And so the the other question was about uh, the composite struct literals from last time. You're right. I need to. That'll be part of the cleanup we do next episode. I'll figure out what the deal was with that. I might still leave it the way it is because it at some point it starts to look better having it on separate lines anyway. But uh, I'll figure out why it was wrong and explain it. All right. Good night, everyone, and good luck, Paratrier. Let me know if you get it working. <laughs>